Listening to the hour of the time, I'm William Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, oops, wrong pot. Today we're going to uh, continue with uh, Michael Cottingham's lectures, which actually occurred May the 27th, 1998, at our annual conference on the Thunder Horse Ranch. So make sure you uh, listen carefully and take plenty of notes. I've had uh, a lot of feedback that uh, they're really enjoying uh, Michael Cottingham's. Uh, lectures on herbs, nutrition, and the uh, botanical medicine. So uh, I hope uh, that this adds to your storehouse of knowledge, and I really sincerely hope it helps you and your family. Uh, where were we at? Ten herbs, I think we're at five or so. Uh, peppermint. I think peppermint would make uh, it accessible, easily grown, many varieties, and peppermint is nice. I, what we need now is good stomach herb, something to improve digestion, dispel stagnation, you know, if you've got too much gas, too much flatulence, feel bloated, stuck, have an upset stomach due to influenza, you need a, you need a stomach herb. Um, and peppermint, you know, peppermint is impeccable, you know, cannot be pecked. And uh, you don't have to laugh at jokes. And it's like, we're not meant to be funny. So, if I say it, I'm use myself, basically. But, uh, peppermint, I mean, what can you say? It's great for cramps, spasms. Actually, strong cups of peppermint tea, uh, some women really like it for menstrual cramps. And uh, uterine cramps or spasms uh, associated with menstrual cramps. Because it's a vasodilator, it has antispasmodic action, uh, so that it's really good on the smooth muscles, not necessarily the skeletal muscles, like the spasms or cramps in your skeletal muscle structure, but in your in your smooth muscles, like your stomach and your intestinal tract, uh, it's relaxing. So peppermint can be used like with children who have colic, babies who have cuts, famous in the Mexican herbal tradition. Uh, for remedy for colic. And colic, I don't know if you've read children and, or been around people with children who colic. It's like, it's intense. I mean, you can try massage you can try, you know, my son had colic and I said, it was, I just thought, my God, I gotta develop a formula, otherwise we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do something. You know, we weren't, but I mean, you can see how the, you know, the madness, I mean, incessant crying and screaming, you feel helpless and it's, it's, you know, it's nerve penetrating, screaming. Colic can be wicked. And, uh, you know, it's just screams from hell all of a sudden at three in the morning. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, it's terrifying. So I put catnip fennel together, catnip leaf and fennel seeds, because those were real famous antispasmodics, always been used for gas, cramps, stomach spasms, and, uh, it works just, I made, I made a non-alcohol extract, a glyceride, I use glycerin and catnip, and it's just like magic, you know, just within five minutes, the spasms and cramps, and you know something works, for like, you know a formula works if somebody with shingles comes in and says, hey, that really works, because shingles are excruciating and painful, you know a collar formula is really right on the money, really works when, when the mothers come back and like, start to worship you, you know, and worship your father, your children, and such, because you took away, like, the worst case, she not sit there, and it's exaggeration, but, you know, when you get feedback in situations that are basically impenetrable, you know you've got a formula that's pretty legitimate, and, um, peppermint, 
is in there. I've never been, I've used it with, it's famous in the Mexican herbal tradition. I chose catnip and fennel because they're, they're, they work better, but peppermint is accessible. Catnip could be grown, uh, fennel seeds can be grown. Those are all three great stomach herbs. So I'll give you, I'll give you for herb number six here in the top ten list, three to choose from for improving digestion, for dispelling stagnation, for stopping spasms and cramps associated with food poisoning, uh, colic, uh, you know, influenza, cramps and spasms, either catnip leaf, catnip, fennel seeds, or peppermint. All accessible, all easily grown herbs um, anywhere in the United States. I mean, we all know the history of catnip. Cats love it. And, you know, so I've never been able to validate this, but I read it in two places, and they never cited anything of any, you know, definitiveness. But they say that the reason why cats freak out over catnip and roll in it is because the scent mimics a female cat in heat. You know, resembles a hormonal smell or pheromone smell uh, of a female cat heat. So, but I, you know, I've seen female cats. Uh, they, you know, um, you know, I've seen female cats as well as male cats respond to this. You know, and pheromones I mean affect both male and female, regardless if you want to be homosexual or lesbian. Pheromones cause the body to, you know, to just be. You know, somebody's dumping out pheromones. It's like both men and women are affected. You know. So, Janet Reno cats. Yeah. <laughs> I like certain Arizona stay like people constitutionally have the right to do whatever they want, you know, as long as they don't pass you know, blah blah blah. But um and this is an interesting side of catnip. That's maybe why cats do that, because there's a pheromonal relationship to the plant. Uh you know, just out of, just out of a side note, keep this in mind that plants do not contain hormones. You may read about this. This has nothing to do with the top ten list, but it has something to do with the question. Some people say or read or hear it. I mean, even in some of the top herb magazines where they're writing about some latest great discovery, you know, they'll say for women, this plant contains estrogen or Plants do not contain hormones of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. They contain compounds that may mimic those, thus you get that reaction. But, you, you know, I've seen it written by some of the top herbalists. They just, you know, it's just plants don't contain hormones. They contain substance, substances that uh, mimic that. So, um, you know, just a bit of herbal truth for, you know, that I've come upon. Uh, peppermint, catnip, fennel. Um, what else do we need? We need nerve herbs. We need something for pain. We need something for, um, you know, our nervous system. And let's see, what's successful? Chamomile. I have to give you several herbs to choose from so you have, um, you know, some candidates. Chamomile is very relaxing, very sedating. Um, and you know why? Because it contains, it's an interesting side note that all the plants that I know that work on the nervous system just so happen to have high amounts of calcium. And calcium is like one of the best mineral uh, substances you can give to nourish your nervous system. So if you suffer from sciatica, you suffer from neurological stress, herpes, uh, retrograde viruses, if you're suffering from a spinal injury, uh, where you damage the nerve bundles, running up and down the spine, if you uh, any neurological uh, stress, if you if you uh, you know at the end of the nerve endings, you have a sheath, you have a protective sheath called. I never remember if it's a myelin or mylar sheath. I think it's the myelin sheath, and it's the it's the protective um, you know protective signal coating. It's like there, there's like an intelligence in the sheath, and I think stress. Viruses like the herpes viruses, they love the nerve ending uh, that sheath and they impair the growth. When you damage, you get too much stress or you get an illness or you damage your nervous system, especially the nerve endings, you you damage the myelin sheath and you can actually, you have to regenerate it. And a lot of illnesses and a lot of neurological stress and damage sets in because you do not 
we generate the myelin sheet on a regular basis. So you set the stage for herpes viruses to hide in the, in the nerve endings. And this is my theory, an empirical observation. I have no science to back it up. As some of the things I have, there's just no science on it, you know, but it's, I treat it that way and I use the herbs that seem appropriate and boom, I get some response. So here's another doctor for someone because there's a, there's a great concept here. Um, anyways, we need a nerve herb and uh, chamomile because it contains high amounts of calcium. It's safe for children, it's safe for the elderly folks, safe for people who may be on all kinds of pharmaceutical medicines. Um, and it can be relaxing. You can make a mild cup of tea, or you can make a super strong cup of tea. Say so you could use a teaspoon per cup for children, and, and then you just want a mild sedation, or you can use a full tablespoon and really relax. And uh, it's uh, not only does it relax, have a lot of calcium, but chamomile can help you regenerate the myelin sheath of the nerve endings. And that's a big thing. That can actually mean, that means over time you will have a stronger nervous system, you will have less problems with stress, with insomnia. An advantage to the herbs that are good for the nervous system um, is that you're they're not like the narcotic drugs where you have to keep taking them and keep taking them, then move to the stronger one, move to the next stronger one. The herbs up for the nervous system heal the nervous system, make it strong. That's an amazing thing. And stress, you know, stress is the ravaging aspect for the nervous system. And as I've mentioned out there, then that ties into the immune system. And if your nervous system is impaired, your immune system is more you know, the inability of dealing with things is greater if your nervous system. The nervous system is part of the immune system. Just to clarify, what is the immune system? Because I think a lot of people might have a very vague understanding of the immune system. The immune system is everything that you are. The immune system uh, comprises the mind, the body, the spirit. You can break it down. The immune system is the liver. The kidneys, the spleen, the lymph glands, the lungs, the immune system is everything. And to use immunostimulants are, is to use substances that encourage your body basically to heal naturally, just to encourage just natural healing. Um, you can refine and focus in on the immune system and get down to the white blood cells, the red blood cells, lung tissue, blah, blah, blah. But if you just the immune system is your innate body's mechanism to fight the world around you, to maintain homeostasis. The prime directive of the immune system is to maintain homeostasis and balance in the body, plain and simple. And whatever you can do, so many different things to encourage that. Chamomile, by regenerating your myelin sheath, by drinking chamomile, if you're a stressed out person, having trouble with insomnia, uh, nervous twitching, just hypertensive, muscles, you feel tight, tense, worn out, wake up restless, wake up fatigued after you start 10 hours, you might try some calcium-rich nerve herbs. Um, chamomile can be grown anywhere. It's not easily found in the wild. Let's, um, I'll tell you one that can be found in the wild and is grown, and there are many different species, is a plant called valerian. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. It has nothing to do with Valium. That's a big herbal rumor just for, you know, just squash that. It's a big rule, you know, or, you know, a commerce rumor that Valerian is where Valium comes from. Other than having the letter V, there's no similarity between the two entities. Valium is something totally chemically orientated and Valerian root is a plant the official one is Valeriana officinalis, grown anywhere in the world, and it is a powerful sedative plant, both skeletal muscles and smooth muscles, and will knock you on your butt if you take too much of it. One out of 50 people who take Valerian will get heart palpitations and will feel stimulated instead of sedated. And those people should just not take Valerian. I'm one of those people. If I take Valerian, I get grouchy, hyperactive, and can't sleep. And it's a powerful sedative. And I don't have any thyroid problems. It's just the nature of Valerian. And that's the only side effect of contraindication. And speaking of contraindications, if you do any pharmaceutical drugs 
the general rule. I've seen 50, 60, and I don't know, I've well, lost, I stopped counting, maybe 60,000 clinical people, not people just buying incense or, uh, you know, just perfumes or, you know, that level stuff. Clinical people, 60,000 people, and two rules of thumb that, uh, the major rule of thumb is never take a pharmaceutical drug and an herbal medicine at the same time. Give them at least an hour apart. And use common sense. I mean, like, if somebody's on a blood thinner, don't give them an herb as a blood coagulant. I mean, and if you follow that common sense contraindications, like, you know, if this person needs to be sedated, don't give them speedy herbs. You know, common sense type of, you know, objectives here. And say an hour apart between pharmaceutical drugs and herbal medicine, out of 60,000 people, I have never seen a conflict of using herbal medicines with common sense and that rule concerning pharmaceutical drugs. But I still don't believe in the carte blanche thing that herbal medicine is safe, carte blanche. I, you know, now I still have to ask questions. I still want to cover the bases. And it always tease me off when people, you know, it's the third visit and I finally say, oh, you know, I forgot to tell you, I'm on uh, Digitalis. I'm like, oh my God, it's like, how did I escape that one? You know, it's like, and you come to realize that herbs are very forgiving. You know, even though you can, like, you spend three hours with a person, have them fill out a questionnaire, and they still just don't, you know, I treat my work as being an herbal detective, as being a detective, a healthcare detective, and as much information as I can get from you, as much as you want to volunteer, it just helps me construct an empirical world. You know, it's like, it's helped me. It just sometimes takes two or three hours, but the fact is after three hours, the person says, you know, Oh, yeah, I did work with solvents. Yeah, in fact, for four or five years, I helped my father load the plane with, uh, with aerial herbicides. And I used to play in stuff. And then now I even made a pillow out of the, the bags that it came in. And it's like the missing piece of information that clicks in everything else they told me. It took three hours to get there. But you can never ask enough questions concerning, especially the problems. You've gone to the dermatologist. You've gone to all the doctors. You've spent tens of thousands of dollars. And, of course, the amount of time has been five, ten minutes here or there. The questions have been very limited. And to really solve some really simple but get bizarre health problems, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask, ask people what their parents did for, where did they live, what kind of water they drank, what was their food like, what they used for recreation, how did their aches and pains affect them, on and on and on and on. We have a questionnaire that we developed, and if they fill this out, then this questionnaire allows me to ask some more specific questions, but as time goes on and more visits take place, their constitution, their entire the constitution of the human body starts to unfold and I start to get an idea if their liver is deficient or slow or sluggish or if it's excessive, hot and fiery. I get to understand if their kidneys are deficient and not filtering or if their kidneys are excessive and they are putting too much urine out and there's too many, etc., etc. And it's like, as time unfolds, you get to get, understand a picture of the human body and then you can really start to match herbs and to actually solve really complex problems that everyone else has failed. Because allopaths by nature do not give enough time to illnesses. It's just, they can't, they have too much overhead. You know, they have to, they have a five, ten minute visit, they have to get X amount of dollars and there are good people in allopathic medicine. You never get me wrong on that. I, I'm actually a defender of many of my doctor friends and nurses. I defend them against people who come and attack them, and I hate them. They just do that. It's like these people were never taught any other alternative. The medical schools are totally controlled by the pharmaceutical trade. They nurture. They they cultivate. They you know, they used to you know golf passes, ski vacations, Bahama trips. I mean, these were what the reps gave doctors for selling the drugs. And I mean, doctors and nurses are not given any tools in this country except that one or two new medical schools, Dr. Wild School and the University of Arizona, um, and in fact, you know, they're always looking for patients with complex histories because they're integrating allopathic medicine and alternative medicine. 
is the uh, School of Integrative Medicine, Medicine at the University of Arizona. I ended up by Dr. Wild, very important uh, school. And cause he's incorporating herbs, acupuncture, and here's the Harvard MD that for years used 40 botanical medicines for every pharmaceutical drug that he recommended, a 40 to 1 ratio. And this was a Harvard trade MD that's actually revolutionized medicine in this country just in the last couple of years. I mean, he's, he's phenomenal. And uh, he's, a, he's a brilliant individual. And that school, if you ever have a problem that you can't solve or find help, it's a very, if you want the help of knowledgeable MDs and alternative, that school is a, is a very good school to consider. If you can get in, if you can make the appointments and, and other taking patients, they're always really booked. But anyways, uh, we're at, uh, we're still in the nerve herbs. Chamomile um, is growable. Uh, what was the other one I just said? Valerian. We're still on Valerian. Valerian uh, is a powerful sedative and is really you know, it kind of, some people don't like it because valerian root smells somewhere like, it smells like, like if you had taken rotten peaches and stuffed them in a dirty socks that were a week old. Um, cats love the smell. I don't know, maybe it's another pheromonal relationship, I don't know. But it's like dirty socks with rotten peaches kind of, uh, it's a really, really interesting smell. So when you see valerian root in the wild, it really, you never forget the plant. Never forget it whatsoever. It's a very distinct smell. And listen, when you, when you go on herb walks, if you feel confident with the person telling you about the information, I mean, I always like, kind of like, really just taste this plant, touch this plant, smell this plant. Because I'll tell you, if, you know, if you get the taste down, if you get the smell down, and it's springtime and you don't have a flower, you know, those are, you know, it's not just sight, it's smell, it's taste that help you in identification of a plant and the impregnation of the, the information in the human body. You need to feel it, taste it, smell it, spit it out, you know, make jokes about it. And that is a relationship. And that's what you can't hide from the bad taste of herbal medicine. Are there some plants that are mimic that are really not the same plant? <laughs> and there's like, it looks like learned but it looks like anything that can There are plants in the beginning that actually are, that, you know, the plants, you know, are there similarities between plants that kind of mimic and could be confusing? Yes, uh, especially in the beginning. I mean, you might not notice that the, that the leaf is as tapered as it should be, and it's a little bit, starts to taper, but then it broadens out and tapers down. And you may not see that and, and immediately think it's that plant. If you start thinking that way, and you haven't tasted or smelled it, or actually really saw it, um, and just kind of thrown in a cat, you could actually say, oh, it's that plant. And you can mention that to someone, and, and I've even done that, and it's frightening because, I mean, when it's, you know, it's good to have some of your partner and have somebody kind of say, no, it's not. You know, and you feel like, oh my God, what are you know, it's like, but I've never gone past four or five feet without saying, you know what, that wasn't that plan. I mean, I learned to correct myself. And I, you know, sometimes it's just, you have to really look. And it does take time, and it takes confidence in yourself. And, and another mistake people make is that they know it's the right plant and it's growing amongst a lot of other plants and they kind of get talking to someone, they reach down and they just start grabbing. They're not watching it and they end up grabbing the leaves of some poison hemlock in monks with their peppermint. And I saw somebody do this among, um, up in the White Mountains here along the river. They were just picking away, chatting, and it was like, uh, wild peppermint growing, the, the, the peppermint growing right next to the water hemlock. The water hemlock's pretty, pretty big time toxic. I mean, it's, it's a killer. You know, a piece of the root the size of a marble will kill you, put you in a coma in a couple hours. The leaf would really, you know, you'd be puking your guts up and, and sweating and, you know, blurred vision and such. Um, and they were just grabbing. They just forgot to pay attention to what they're doing. And they were like grabbing leaves of the water hemlock, writing with the peppermint. And I'm like, hey, look, you know, there's water hemlock leaves with this. What are you doing? You know, it's like, and these people aren't stupid. It's just they just lost their train of participation. Is that your wife grabbing those hemlock? 
No, it was like somebody on her wall, you know, they have gone off picking plants and keeping the eye on them and said, man, I'm going to pay attention to what you're doing, you know, it's like, you know, they'll be puking, you know, instead of stopping stomach cramps or getting real stomach cramps. And, uh, and the habits, I mean, it's like, you really, you know, you really need to stay focused and learn one plan at a time, you know, it's not, and it's not impossible, and it's like, I mean, it's not that confusing, it's just that if you don't participate, if you don't pay attention, you will make mistakes, and, and if you participate, pay attention, you'll hardly ever make mistakes, but you'll still make mistakes at some point in time, and just have to, um, you know, one time, one time it was, uh, I walked out of the shop, and I asked a uh, apprentice, and I wasn't clear in my direction. I asked the apprentice to take these two stock bottles and fill them in, and they were two similar plants by smell. And I, it was at the end of the day, and I kind of walked out, and I'm like 30 miles away, and I'm thinking, my gut feeling, I got to go back there because she put this bottle in that one, and vice versa. And it wouldn't have been lethal, but it's like, you know, small. You just don't make mistakes. You don't put the wrong herb in the wrong bottle as a medicine. I mean, it's just. It's a prime directive. You don't break. You work. Do your damage to never make that mistake. As I race back, I'm instinct, and sure enough, you know, it was just I just thought, I and mean, it just instinct over and over and over that, uh, that something was wrong. And she had accidentally put, you know, the bottle, switched the bottles, and poured, you know, and it would have been fatal, but it would have been, you know, it wouldn't have been right. It was just, and so you have to pay attention. I mean, you were like dealing with like for myself, other people's help. It's, um, the trust that people give you is really frightening and immense. And so you have then the responsibility to, like, do everything in your power to never make a mistake. Even though herbs are forgiving, but not absolutely forgiving. And, you know, and I use some toxic plants. I have some very toxic plants around because one drop of this plant, of this particular plant, you know, aconite, don't write this down, don't use it to four or five years from now, but aconite or monkshood is a very a killer, it's a toxic plant. But one or two drops of aconite is just phenomenal for some types of fevers with neurological pain that's, uh, you know, with morphine-like effects, you know, but more than that, you might aggravate the condition, and, you know, and have this deadly toxin poison around as a major responsibility, but, you know, it's kind of the nature of um, some herbal medicine. So, valerian root is another one to research and to consider in your repertoire. Um, what else do we need? Uh, we need lung herb. We need a really good, accessible lung herb. Um, I'll tell you, both the ginger and yarrow, the circulatory herb, the first herbs that we talked about, ginger and yarrow are both good lung herbs, especially fresh ginger roots and Yarrow, fresh yarrow extracts. They're basodilating and very lung orientated. But let's see, if we're going to pick. If we're going to pick uh, a lung herb that was available nationwide. Um, that plant right there that you guys brought in by the grace of God. Lumberjack toilet paper. Lumberjack toilet paper. Mullen, a very common plant throughout the entire United States. California to the East Coast can be grown in just about any garden situation. Forms a big uh, basil rosette of leaves with a big stalk with yellow flowers at the very top. And mullen itself is one of the plants that has 20 or 30 different possible uses. You could use the root, you could use the leaves, you could use the flowers. Um, mullen leaf would be our universal accessible lung herb that we could get uh, just about anywhere in the United States, wild collected or grown in our gardens. And it's a great respiratory sedative and expectorant. So it's really good, like, if you have a heavy mucus cough or even a dry cough with no mucus, and you have a hectic, uh, raspy, uh, incessant cough that's just endless, nonstop, and spasmodic. It's a respiratory sedative with an expectorating, bronchial dilating aspect. So it will open up your lungs, open up the bronchi so you can breathe at the same time, stopping spasms and spasmodic action. And uh, it's a great plant. Best done as a tea. Best done as a tea plant. 
this bridge went, there's a bunch of them right there in the road coming in. Yeah, it's a very, um, you know, it's a first two plants, probably make better leaf, the tea material. The root of mullein, just as, uh, just as a side note, is one of the best, um, muscle strengtheners for the entire urinary tract, especially the tribal muscles. So if you suffer from uh, incontinence or bedwetting or you suffer from frequent urination, um, you know, you have kind of a weak kidney, weak bladder, uh, get urinary tract infections frequently, mullen root, is, is, mullen root tea is really good at strengthening the tissue of the urinary tract, which is a good, mullen root is a good admixture to things like uh, small palmetto berry for men who take it for prostate enlargement or prostate health. Um, women who have had a history of urinary tract infections, especially after antibiotic use, mullen root is really good. And the leaf, uh, the flowers of mullen make one of the premier earache oils. An analgesic, pain, sedating um, medicine that helps to, to uh, antifungal and aseptic, but it's also analgesic, so it helps pain, works as a lot of your eggs are fungal oriented. And in fact, if you take, make mullein flower oil, when I can describe how to make the mullein flower oil, it's best seen, but you can read about it, and, and uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's a reference point. Mullein flower oil, a couple drops in each ear, two or three times a day, in conjunction with red root or some echinacea and red root added to hot ginger tea will effectively almost be, you'll almost be able to treat almost any child with an earache infection with that combination. We've seen it, we've used it with our kids, we've seen it with other people's kids, um, children, um, you know, and it's, you know, occasionally they have such a super infection that it's just, you know, antibiotics become a choice. Now, I want to mention something here real quick about antibiotics. I'm glad, they, I'm glad they're invented. I'm glad that they're here because to have antibiotics for some gangrene bacteria, gas gangrene, the bacteria, um, some of the staph and strep bacteria, to have them and to also know of herbal medicines that are immunostimulating makes for the best combination in the world. Antibiotic means anti-life. Antibiotics kill everything in the system. They kill funguses, they kill bacteria, they don't kill viruses, but they kill, when you take an antibiotic for bacterial infection, you disrupt the flora and fauna of your intestinal tract for months and months, and if you do a series of antibiotics, you can end up disrupting your intestinal tract flora and fauna for years, and out of that disruption, you can have a, start to develop a history of candida, allergies, digestive problems, liver deficiencies, all traced back to the use of antibiotics, and those antibiotics impaired. You know, in our intestinal tract, they've identified 400 different types of bacteria, beneficial bacteria alone. 400. That's just bacteria that live in our gut. 400 species of different types of bacteria. That's not that's bacteria. That's not funguses like the candidas. We have about nine different types of candidas that live in our body. Candida albicans, etc. I don't know all the species. We have all kinds of different funguses. We have amoebas. A beneficial amoebas. When you take antibiotics, you disrupt that in such a severe way that the body is thrown out of homeostasis on a bacterial, fungal, micro animal level that it takes a lot of problems arise. Allergy problems. You know, allergy problems really never existed in in the medicine scene here in America until the introduction of antibiotics into dairy products and into meat products and into and into the med medicine scene. I mean there was a, there was a, no doubt some allergic allergy problems, but the prevalent widespread problems that people, you know, encounter with allergies are not traceable prior to the thirties on any significant level. Mother's milk, is that the mother's milk, bacteria and stuff? Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Mother's milk is, is 
the natural delivery of the mother's inherited and acquired immunity to the child. If you take that away, you've actually crippled it. It started off in the world with a crippled immune system because so much has been eliminated. What to get delivered, I don't know, but we know the importance of that. And uh, you can see that with how Johnson and Johnson and, and the big makers of, you know, whatever the formulas are called, moved into the third world countries and watched the correlation of all the different deficiencies and illnesses that arise because they got the people there dependent on the pharmaceutical formulas. And they took them away from the mother's milk because it was the seductive Babylonian way, you know, and everybody wants to do it our way. Everybody wants everything we got, every blah, 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 and not everything we have is that good, you know, like our medicine. I mean, so many people throughout the world are ditching their folklore and their native inherited oral traditional medicines handed down for thousands of years through this village line and through this, this native bloodline, and they want to ditch it for penicillin and, and Prozac, and, you know, because it's the Western way, it's more, they've been sold, and you know, you know this, I don't have to elaborate on that. Not, my point is that you can use antibiotics and immunostimulants to get the best of both worlds. Antibiotics kill everything. Antibiotic means anti-life. Immunostimulants stimulate your immune system naturally. Now remember I was talking about echinacea and how it stimulates the white blood cells to go out and scavenge. If you take antibiotics and they kill everything, wouldn't it make sense to increase your white blood cells to more garbage men to move out more of this combat debris that's taking place. So red root echinacea in conjunction with penicillin give you the best of both worlds if you have to take antibiotics. It's the best. And then to mop up, it's really good to use things like acidophilus. It's good things to use. Um, I started, I started introducing this practice with people is they take an apple, cut it in half, leave it on the counter, and let bacteria natural airborne bacteria so not let it rot and become putrid and botulism oriented but take a banana lay it peel it lay it on a plate on the counter for a few hours take an apple cut it in half leave it on the counter for a few hours and eat that you will actually be re-establishing a lot of the different types of bacteria and you'd be amazed at how your some of your allergy problems begin to dissipate when you start to bring some of your flora and fauna i often think this too i think that not only are we, you know, we do extinct, you know, extinction is a natural occurring thing, but we obviously do extinct large mammals and large things, you know, just by the nature of the other extinctions, you know, some of it premeditated, some of it, you know, some of it, you know, some of it accidental, some of it just natural, you know, extinction is a natural event in, in life, but, um, and in all life forms, but we do, through our behavior, purposely, is, you know, it cause extinction of large things. I got thinking one time, what have we done on a microorganism level? What have we, look at nuclear explosions, look at atmospheric testings, look at pollution. I don't know this, it's a theory, it's a hypothesis, but if we macro extincted species, what have we extincted on a micro level that used to live in here, and now that it's gone off the face of the earth due to what we've done, or what nature's done, by whatever reasons, but those organisms, organisms that we used to have are gone now because allergies are really hard to solve. There's missing pieces to the puzzle. A lot of it has to do with digestion. Some of these herbs will help in that. Um, but a lot of it has to do with these microorganisms. And we are also a culture that fear, we fear, we overcook things, we sterilize things, we fear bugs. I mean, there's good reason. I mean, that, you know, not washing your hands, you can transmit hepatitis and organisms, but, you know, we over bleach your food, chlorinate, preserve, overcook, et cetera, et cetera, and what you end up with is you've reduced the chi and the strength of the food, but you've also eliminated the microorganisms, which for me is a frontier. I don't have all the answers. I've really been looking into this because there's, I've adapted a few things and brought them into my practice, and I've seen, I've seen them affect people in a very positive, just the apple 
cutting an apple and leaving an on the counter. If you had too much antibiotics in your system, if you had a disruption, if you drink too much chlorinated water, if you've been exposed to solvents and chemicals, you might want to consider getting your hand on some you know, little critters and eating them and reestablishing that. And I, you know, I don't object to someone going out and pulling a carrot out of the ground with dirt on it, organically grown carrot in organically rich soil, that if you were an earthworm, this would be paradise type of soil. Pulling a carrot out of the soil, brushing off the dirt or lightly washing it in the water and eating it and not being obsessed with scrubbing it down. You know, have you ever seen children eat dirt? I've seen children eat dirt after having influenza. You know, there's puking and puking and cropping and diarrhea, and they've been, they, that activity alone will disrupt flora. Influenza will disrupt flora in the intestinal tract immensely. I've seen children go out and literally just eat dirt after going through a period of vomiting and uh, diarrhea. What's that all about? I don't really know, but I'm, I'm thinking, what is this about? You know, what's going on here? That's empirical medicine. That's that's collecting. That's a collective medicine. And that's that's how what I, you know, it's another answer. So we've got a longer good mullen. You can actually make mullen, ginger root, uh, yarrow, oregano, all those oregano ginger any herbs that are good for the circulatory system are really good for the lungs, believe it or not. They're just herbs that vasodilate, get blood moving, are really good for stuck sinuses and stuck lung conditions. Uh, almost across the board. Um, what else we got? I don't know where we're at. And, uh, um, number nine. You need number nine? No, that was number nine. Okay. Um, what about garlic? Garlic. Um, yeah, let's get it. Garlic, onions, any of the alliums, any of those, uh, without a doubt. Garlic, garlic is an amazing medicine for lowering cholesterol levels, for building up immunity. It's a powerful antiviral. It's a powerful immunoseptic, uh, powerful immunostimulant. It's a very powerful antiseptic. The juice of garlic will kill staph immediately on, in a petri dish. I mean, that's that's phenomenal enough. I mean, what you know? I mean, staph is in a Remember the flat, flesh-eating bacteria that we all heard about? But then, you know, I mean, that's staph. That's staph gone wild. That's staph, and there might be some other species, but that's a staph bacteria that's actually mutated due to the abuse of antibiotics. Now, there are some countries in this world that actually prohibit their doctors from overusing antibiotics. Actually, have an amazing parameter of when they can use antibodies. Some of the Scandinavian countries have lowered uh, their infection rates and have kept the same antibodies for a longer period of time and have never had to progress to the real vicious detrimental because they limited their physicians with you know with legislation. They could not. Or in this country, it was like boom, 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 and. You know, if you go for antibiotics, I'm guilty of this, you know, it's like you start feeling better and you stop taking it. What you've done is you have literally helped contribute to the mutation of the virus or the bacteria. You need to do the whole, the whole cycle. You know, and I've done, you know, you can start feeling better, I don't mean it, I'll save it for next time or something like that. And you're guilty of adding to the, um, you know, to the rise and mutation of, of the new strains. Uh, garlic is powerful for wounds, for, for staph infected wounds, and for infections, um, gangrene like infections. So garlic stimulates circulation, garlic can lower blood pressure, um, so it's good in hypertensive, high, you know, um, high blood pressure situations. It could be offshoots of use of garlic, and we're not, we're talking about garlic. We're not talking about garlic powder, we're not talking about um, garlic capsules, we're talking about cloves of fresh garlic, either eaten raw or just crushed, after you've cooked your food, crushed and put it on the food with no cooking or minimal cooking. You can still cook with it, but if you want the powerful medicine aspects of garlic, you want to do it when it adds to your food just prior to serving it and don't cook it at all. It destroys many of the powerful chemical constituents through the, through the application of heat. What food are those garlic? 
What's the key that gives allicin? Is the, that's the chemical constituent that I think that the, those pills contain, they're the oldest pills that contain the, the constituent allicin, and uh, that's all. I mean, garlic has, you know, I don't know how many chemical compounds, but it's got more than just allicin. Yeah, it actually has, you know, at least another one. You know, I mean, they just, allicin has been proven for the high blood pressure aspect, but we're talking, this plant's, this thing is antiviral, it's antibacterial, um, you know, it, it's great for the immune system, it makes better red blood cells, and you don't get that from the odorless little capsule. You'll get some benefits, but you won't get the immensity of the plant. What happens if you just break that garlic plug out and kill it? Um, it could sit in your stomach and really cause your burning and irritation. Uh, but the way you do it is to take a clove of garlic, cut it in half, and mash it up because allicin actually needs to be oxidized a little bit. If you want that chemical constituent, you need to at least cut the piece of garlic in half, crush it, let it expose to the atmosphere for a few seconds, and then you create that compound. That compound doesn't exist unless it oxidizes. Or, you know, there's oxidization has to take place in order for this compound to exist. Then wrap it up in a piece of bread. Make one of you do that, and you're just kind of arbitrarily take a piece of bread and pull it apart, make a little ball, stick a piece of garlic in that ball of bread and swallow it, and it will, it will digest and break apart without irritating your stomach lining. It's a great way to make pills, herbal pills, is um, pieces of bread, flatten it out, and make them so you swallow or put the herb that may taste nasty or, or be irritating in the center and wrap it around and make bread pills. Absolutely, yeah. Um, crushed garlic and oil for celibacy is a great application. Remember, food is the best medicine. Any one of these herbs that transcends the border between food slash medicine allows you to use it more. Probably has greater, always has greater medicine, greater vitamins and mineral potential if it's a food slash medicine like garlic is. Um, Garlic oil, in fact, when you take crushed garlic and stick it in olive oil at a 1 to 3 ratio, one part of crushed garlic to three parts of olive oil, and you let the garlic, crushed garlic, sit in the olive oil for a week or two and then strain it out, then you have what's called garlic oil. And if you have cats or dogs that get ticks or mites in the ears, it's a really good, it's a really good home veterinarian remedy for putting a few drops of garlic oil. They're not going to like it, but it's, it's, it's inexpensive and as effective as most of the veterinarian mite drops that go into the ear or the tick drops. That's where the vampire thing came from. That's where the vampire thing came from. That's a group, that's, that's, a, that's a good empirical observation. <laughs> Keeps ticks. Blood sucking, you know, fleas away and such. Um, your basic <laughs> and your basic vampire. And your basic vampire. Garlic oil as capsules. Um, I mean, you'll get some, you'll get some medicinal benefits, but you're really missing out on, um, you know, the immediate benefits. I mean, I mean, it, you know, use what works. I'm not saying you have to taste all this bitter, horrible, irritating stuff, and they, you know, eat, eat, you know, go through all the euphoria and the disgust in the, in the mouth and totally, you know, totally revel in these new taste sensations. I mean, you want to use what works. You want to, you want to, if something is so horrible that you're not going to drink it, make it weaker or find ways to use it, you know, I mean, Remember, a lot of the information I'm giving you is firsthand what I've seen, but I'm an oral herbalist, oral traditionalist, and I pass out information that helps you establish your own herbal oral tradition for yourself, your family, and for whoever else, if anyone else you want to choose to do it with. And so find, take this, some of this information and make it work for you and tailor it. And what you're essentially doing is creating your own herbal oral tradition. And that's the art of herbal medicine. The information in the books, information like from weirdos like me, um, 
information gleaned from the grandmas or from wherever. But what you're doing is you're taking this and creating your own herbal tradition for yourself, your family, for your particular own set of problems, your family's own problems, where you live. And that is the beauty and the art of herbal medicine. It really allows you to do this. You know, a little science, a little folklore, create your own tradition to pass on to your children. And that is, that's always pretty exciting. You know those parsley bread fresh thing they come like little little capsules for the oil and have, I think, heart disease in them? And they have that kind of compression. Parsley, bread medicine, parsley. I don't. I know parsley itself is really good carminative. It, it, it is refreshing. It is ha, does have an absorptive aspect to it uh, for absorbing odors. I I've never tried them. I don't have any firsthand reality there with them. I you see them for sale. Um, and a lot of people like them, so there's probably validity to it. I mean, what I know about parsley, it would make sense that that would be an area that would probably reduce some benefits. Um, have a parsley plant grown in your kitchen or in your garden, just chewing it would be cheap, easy, and immediately effective, and probably the most optimal. No, thanks. Um, any other questions at this point? Because Dora has a number nine. What about lemons and limes? Lemons and limes. Um, lemons and limes could definitely be, you know, I mean, especially, it could be in the top ten if you if you live in the tropics or if you lived in areas where you could grow them. They are all accessible for us now. Lemons and limes both are totally enhanced septic substance. Um, you know, I mean, lemons and limes squeezed, I mean, they might going to sting a little bit, but uh, they're, and they're not nowhere near as anti uh, staff as garlic juice on wounds. But lemon and limes are very acidic. Acidic substances really do have the potential of being good antimicrobial agents. Um, acidic substances inside, they often say that lemon and lime juice, you know, not only do you get the vitamin C content, let's not forget that, high amounts of vitamin C, uh, scorbic acid and such, but lemons and limes taken internally are very powerful acidic astringents. Uh, some lemon and lime combinations, they say, are very beneficial for gallstone formation, breaking down gallstone and kidney stones. I do know that lemon and lime juice taken in water is really good for people who have the, the need for frequent urination and they have weak kidneys. And, and they, what they need to do is tighten up the tissue of the urinary tract with an astringent, an acidic astringent, especially if they've had a history of bacterial infections. Um, that's about all I know. Vitamin C, acidic astringent, good for the urinary tract. Um, and it tastes good. I mean, it's, I read somewhere, I don't remember where, but I don't remember that most of the nutritional value that is found in living the lives are in the healing and not actually in the food itself. I think a lot of you know the peel of the lemons and limes, the nutritional value. I think I think there's at least I don't know about nutritional value, but medicinal value. If you ever, I'll tell you a concept of the bitters, uh, stomach bitters. If you ever taste lemon peel, lime peel, orange peel, and it's very bitter, those alkaloids that are in that are powerful bitters. Uh, alkaloids by nature are chemi complex chemical structures that are bitter by nature. Although I don't know of any alkaloid. Nicotine is an alkaloid. All alkaloids end in I-N-E. Nicotine, anabasine, um, um, caffeine, those are all alkaloids, complex chemical structures, any in INE, and they all by nature have a bitter, bitter aspect to them. Uh, and alkaloids perform many functions. Alkaloids are bitter and they deter insects and funguses. You know, alkaloids are almost always anti. The thing about the orange peel or the lime peel, the lemon peel, that it's bitter. If you were a fungus or an insect and knew by nature that alkaloids are antifungal and deterrents for insects, you can understand why the bitter the peels are going to be bitter. Alkaloids are developed throughout whatever reasoning have developed on the peel to repel funguses and disease and insects. 
But we can take those alkaloids and use them medicinally because our body really is, look at the, how our body responds to caffeine. Look at how our body responds to nicotine and all the alkaloids. Um, the alkaloids are powerful medicinal structures. They are almost always bitter by nature, antifungal, almost always immunostimulating just by being alkaloids and being irritated and they stimulate the immune system. Uh, alkaloids by nature almost always cause the upper GI, the liver, the gallbladder to become very active, very juicy. Bitter substances contain alkaloids and bitters, I gotta mention this, the Chinese say that there are five tastes. Sweet, sour, acrid, salt, and bitter. Now the Ayurvedic, you know, a few other philosophies say seven tastes, five, but they break those five essential down into six or seven more, or eight more. But basically, it's five tastes: sweet, sour, acrid, salt, and bitter. In the American standard American diet, bitter substances we don't have them. What are the two most bitter substances that we have? Um, Coffee, chocolate, and what do we do? We sweeten the heck out of it to make it not bitter. Do we have any bitter greens? In my research, in my you know talking to old world people, uh, people from Italy or Greece or Germany, you know that classic salads were bitter. They weren't iceberg lettuce with sweet ranch dressing. They were bitter herbs to stimulate bitters, to stimulate gastric secretion, gastric movement. And I'll tell you, without going in depth to the upper and lower GI, without going into all the what bitters do and such, if you just realize that the Chinese are right, you know, five thousand sometimes they've got down five thousand years in this art form of healing and concepts, that those five tastes are really an absolute concept as far as I'm concerned, and that the fact that we're missing bitters, we only have four. We do we have poor digestion in this country. And by bringing a bitter substance back into your diet, you bring in the missing taste. That's it for today, folks. Good night, and God bless each and every single one of you. been listening to the Hour of the Time, I'm William Cooper. 
Be sure and tune in tomorrow at the same time for another episode of the Hour of the Time.